said that the period from 1928 to 1943 in which penicillin was developed as a therapeutic was a result of the hard work of an Australian, Sir Howard Florey. That without him and without, without what he brought from Australia, we would never have had penicillin. Just had to say that. <laughs> So we're going to open um, to questions. We have st stayed pretty much on time. We're running a little bit late. We've got about an hour. Um, how we're going to run this is we'll take questions from inside the room and there are microphones. So I'd, we'll, we'll select the person, put your hand up, the mic will come to you if you could announce your name and the, the question, nice, as, as Ralph said, nice, short, sharp, succinct. Um, simple declarative English, perhaps. Um, and so I'd actually, Kate, you've got a, a, a question, is that right, from, we've, we've also had how many hundred questions registered on the internet? About a hundred. About a hundred questions registered on the internet from uh, people um, interested in this forum who are watching on the web. So should we start um, with the first question, Kate? This one comes from Ed and Diane, and it says, over the last four days, more than 350 people have signed a petition located at change.org. This petition asks that conference attendees and others in a position of influence place immediate attention on how to have successful phase two and off-label ALS treatments made available to patients now. We petitioners ask the conference and the panel to proactively respond to the petition. We can do this by forming a working group of key stakeholders and others to meet within the next 30 days by teleconference or web conference. Fantastic. And the URL for that, or do we, do we know? Or can we well, that was change.org. We, we do have the URL. Um, URL uh, URL, but it's so lengthy, okay, I don't think I out. could even try. <laughs> um, You'll find it on change.org. Orla, could you comment on that, please? Yes, I, I, think, um, I think patient advocacy is, is really important. I think the idea of having a patient advocacy as a strong uh, d d drive towards development is really, really important, and, and you know, up to phase through two is still part of the valley of death. I would urge a note of caution, though. I mean, there is a a very good reason why we have clinical trial designed the way it is. Um, it is to protect us from drugs that don't work or that are, are, are excessively dangerous. Um, I know that the latter may, may uh, many people who have motor neuron disease will, may be willing to take much bigger risks than, than the regulatory authorities may, may wish to accept, but there is a balance to be had. I would be very concerned about having off-label label drugs uh, become available that, that uh, uh, hadn't been uh, subject to rigorous clinical trial. And I do think that drugs that uh, have been so called successful in phase two studies still need to go through a process uh, to ensure uh, efficacy um, before they, they become in the market. But I think that there is a very strong case to be made to speed it up and to make it cheaper. And I think, I think that's true better cl clinical trial design, um, be be better funding. Uh, uh, public, publicly available funding. We, we are very much at the mercy at the moment of the pharma industry in clinical trial development. And I think that's, that's part of the problem. Uh, there's a, a big commercial um, uh, process that underpins drug development at the, at, at the present time. And so, so uh, uh, generating funds to, to promote the most uh, promising drugs uh, that are not necessarily uh, commercially driven, at least up to phase three, I think, uh, is really the way we should be looking at things. Thanks, Ola. There, well, there are two examples of that. The, uh, you know, there's the Herceptin story, which was driven by patients with breast cancer. And there was also the Gleevec story with CML. And Novartis tried to kill it off. And it was only with patient advocacy and, and the advocacy of their scientists. Bob, do, do you want to make a comment about how to get farmers' ear? Because Novartis almost killed off Gleevec, which, which pretty much stops myeloid leukaemia. Novartis killed it off, almost killed it off, because their response was there are only a thousand people in North America with CML. So that's not a big enough market. Uh, only to say briefly that part of 
I think the task before us is to convince uh, pharma that the market may in fact be much larger than uh, is thought. So this uh, disease, is ridiculously enough, is called an orphan disease. But very telling on Kevin Talbot's epidemiology slide was the quietly stated point that one in 500 people uh, uh, basically will die of ALS. Now for a country like the United States, that means that 600,000 people now alive in, in the United States will die of ALS. And I would submit to you that that's not an orphan disease and that that represents a huge market if developed properly. Can I comment on that as well? Actually, yes, please. The CNORF72 story would suggest that the, um, the, the target market is even bigger because there's, there's a huge overlap between C9 or 72, um, which is the, the address of the gene in ALS, and frontal temporal dementia. Frontal temporal dementia is the second most common dementia um, after Alzheimer's disease. So that's, that's, there's a, quite a large um, uh, group. It's, it's a very understudied disease as well. It's only been known for about 10 or 15 years. But there's a big overlap, as people know, between ALS and FTD in terms of the biology of what's going on. So there is a big market out there. So if I can open it up to the floor, do we have some questions from the floor? So, um, yes, ma'am, over there in the white, can you wait till the microphone comes to you and if you could state well, your while, name? While the mic is moving there, maybe it's worthwhile to decode the C9 or 72. It's such an unfortunate <laughs> name for a very important <laughs> gene and it's, it's caused this for a region. Basically, when the human genome was sequenced, um, we knew enough about what genes looked like to guess whether or not they were there. And if they hadn't been studied before, they were just cataloged. And so this happens to be what, you know, the, you know, the 24th gene on the ninth chromosome. And so it's C9, you know, or... Open region. Oh, right. And so, um, and, and so it's just as simple as that. And so, but that should also tell you how little we know about that gene that it still just goes by that sort of um, plot number rather than having a, a zip, sort of more interesting street address. A zip, a zip code, but no street address. A, a zip, yeah. So just coming at the back, right up the yeah. back in the white. Yeah. My um, mother has motor neuron disease. Her sister has multiple sclerosis. Um, and I've spoken to her professor about any known links between those two things. Also, knowing that I'm the next female in the next line of our family, um, wondering what is available to us to find out um, what contributions our genes might have in our family to those two things. Thank you. So I think it's very important to say that most of the genetic studies that have done in the complex field, you know, how do different diseases interact to, to in one family, are done in populations and if you take a particular genetic variant you can say that in an ALS population it's commoner than in a so-called normal population. Attributing and applying that statistic to an individual person in the clinic or their family is an incredibly complex thing and we don't really have yet have the tools to do that. When there is clearly a single gene mutation causing the disease in a very very strong way, a so-called Mendelian effect, then you can say it's 50% uh, chance of, of carrying that genetic variant, which is likely to give you the disease. But let's go back to the C9 or 72 story. We're very uncertain at the moment uh, whether carrying that variant actually, what, what the risk is to an individual. It's a good example because there are lots of people out there carrying that, but actually it also causes uh, a strong genetic disease where it's clearly inherited in the family, and there are plenty of people out there with no family history. So I'm afraid at the moment it's actually very, very difficult to really sit down in front of patients and their families and give anything but a rather general statistical kind of statement. However, I think within a few years we'll be in a different position. Thanks, Kevin. Ma'am, could you state your name for us, please? Yes, Catherine Raphael. Uh, I wanted to ask um, if you can say anything about the nature of progression of motor neurone disease, what causes it to spread from one part of the body to another. And also, um, in the case of uh, someone that has had um, a thoracic onset and is using non-invasive ventilation um, for over a long period of time, what, what is, can you generalise about the progression that will happen in that um, particular situation? Kevin Talbot, do you want to take that one? So I think your question is very profound. 
And I think the answer is we don't know very much uh, about how the disease spreads. I think what we know from seeing anyone who sees hundreds of patients, it becomes, it becomes apparent that this is not random spread. It doesn't just pop out anywhere in your body. If it starts in your right hand, that's where you first experience the first symptom, then I think I, I'm learning how to predict where it might go next with some accuracy. So that implies that there is indeed a process spreading, which is a profound and important point, because if we can model that, if we can understand that, as Bob said, actually stopping the disease in its tracks by stopping the propagation from one area to another would be a major change in our ability to treat the disease. We don't know whether it spreads from one cell to another, adjacent, whether it spreads through cellular contact, these synapses, the way that cells contact each other, or whether it's more complex, it's a more system spread. So the way that the brain organizes the movement of my right hand actually involves big networks of neurons operating in a very complex computerized kind of a way as a parallel network. And actually we don't really know which level that spread is occurring at, I'm afraid. But it's an incredibly profound question. And the second part of the question was about thoracic onset and survival progression? So within any one onset, whether it's your limb, your bulbar muscles, or your respiration, whatever it is, again, it's a similar answer to the question I gave earlier, which is that in groups of people, we can make generalizations. We can say that if it starts in your lower leg and remains in your lower leg for a period of time and spreads to your contralateral lower leg, the other side, that has a certain implication. If it spreads from your arm and immediately affects your respiration or your bulbar muscles, it has another implication. But in, within that group of people, there's a big there's actually a big spread. So some people who have respiratory onset, their breathing muscles are affected first, actually can do quite well if they have early non-invasive ventilation. So I think in an individual case, it requires a high level of experience and skill to really answer that question. So it's a very complicated area. So we might turn to the internet for the next question. This next question is from Kate. As research shows, MND is associated with mutated genes. Does this mean that it's not possible for an MND patient to donate blood or organs? Bob. Yeah. So I would say uh, that up until this time, the presence of an ALS mutation has not prohibited donation of uh, certainly organs. Um, and, and, and that's largely because if one is, uh, for example, talking about transplantation of an organ that doesn't impact on the germline or on transmission to another uh, generation, then there's presumably uh, neither a risk to progeny nor to self. Um, but I think it's clearly a question that is going to loom larger and larger. In fact, others, maybe Kevin Egan, who thinks about transplantation issues, might want to comment as well, although this is a little different than stem cells. But it's an important question. I mean, I, what one can stratify this based on the, the, the transplant in question. Um, there's actually experiments that have been done where bone marrow has been transplanted from an SOD1 animal um, into a normal animal. And um, in that context, that normal animal that was transplanted with bone marrow from the ALS mouse did not get motor neuron disease, right? So um, this should give people like the Red Cross comfort with respect to at least transplant of blood or, or a bone marrow transplant for leukemia. I think that's probably an, an, an important lesson in, in this case. And it's likely to be that um, other non-disease affected um, uh, organs could be beneficially, beneficially used by, by eligible recipients. And, um, and so, I, I, you know, I, from what I know about transplant biology, and I'm not a transplant surgeon, and I think it's important to, to say that, um, um, I, I don't see uh, that there should be any obvious reason that ALS patients in general would be disqualified if that's something that they really felt there'd be value in participating in. Having said that, regulations vary. Um, and, for example, I can't give blood because I lived in England. So, you know, <laughs> don't come close to me, I might give you mad cow disease. <laughs> uh, there's a question up the back. Yes. Uh, th <clears throat> My name is Gudjon. I'm wondering, uh, don't we have enough of those genes? Can't we do something about them? 
Are we collecting faulty uh, genes just to collect them? Yes, thank you. Um, Bob? If I understand the, the question, it is uh, if we have uh, children of uh, ALS families, can we collect and study them in a prospective way? Is that the gist no, of it? I think, I think no, I, I say we have the SOD1 uh, gene. Yeah. Uh, what have we done about yeah. it so to perfect. cure right. the disease? Let, let me say a couple of things, um, because not mentioned yet so far is actually one of the most exciting clinical trials, uh, essentially, I think, that's ever been done in ALS, and that is that uh, there are very good technologies, as I'm sure you must know, for turning off genes in cells using uh, methods that involve shutting down, essentially, that RNA that I mentioned, that is the intermediary between the gene and the protein. And in fact, a Nobel Prize was conferred for this technology only uh, five or six years ago, acknowledging uh, how incredibly important this is. Um, it's, uh, I think, very exciting to say that there is uh, now uh, a a trial already underway through our Niels group in collaboration with a company called ISIS in California to use a variant of that technology, which has actually been around for quite some time, uh, essentially to turn off the SOD1 gene. So we know that we can turn off the SOD1 gene in a Petri dish and stop the Petri dish model. We know that we can turn down the SOD1 gene in the mice and increase survival very substantially depending on how you do it and when it's done. And so there is every reason to believe, based on that proof of concept, that if we can do the same thing in people who have the SOD1 gene, we ought to be able to slow this disease. One thing I think is uh, a, a firm conclusion from all of the mouse and rat work and human work is that SOD1 ALS is dose dependent. The more of the mutant protein there is, the worse the disease. And so if we can turn down the level of the mutant protein, we can help the disease. So the, the very exciting news is that this technology, which involves infusing this agent into the spinal fluid of patients who have the SOD1 mutation, has already proven safe, first in rodents, then in non-human primates, and now in humans. And so the effort is underway to accelerate that, essentially, a study to get to higher and higher doses uh, in, 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 in humans uh, over the next uh, several months. So in fact, I would argue that that, so, so the irony is, if you will, that one of the most terrible forms of this already terrible disease, which is an inherited form, may be actually the first uh, to, be, to, be, to be treated for, for exactly the reasons you've, you've brought up. But I think I, if I could also just, I think this is a really important point, and it's something which is raised almost every time that scientists who work on the disease talk, talk to patients, and, and that is that Discovering the mutation seem, sometimes seems a long way off from, from, from a therapy. And, and I think from, from my own perspective, um, you know, having been following, you know, only in more recent history Bob's, Bob's work, um, it's from a perspective of, of just really trying to fundamentally figure out what's going on. And, um, and, and, and that can be a very frustrating process. Um, I'm sure it's all frustrating for you. It's certainly frustrating for us. And so, uh, scientifically, just trying to build the fundamental foundation of what we know can cause the disease to happen, which are these familial cases, um, are something that we can really hold on to and be very confident about. We can be 100 um, percent certain uh, about those results. We can wonder about a lot of aspects of the environment and their hints here and there, but these are things that we can know um, are, are a problem. And when we know something, um, we can start to do so something about it. And so um, I think that's why there's so much excitement about discovering the genes and turning that in, in into therapies. Um, it, it's, that next step um, is a slow process, but when you're certain about what's causing the problem, um, you can begin to do, to do something about it. And there's real certainty um, around these mutations, and I think that's a very important thing to say. Just to, to oh. bring, bring another example um, back to the cancer model, you know, um, when I was when I was a, a young medical student, which is neither today nor yesterday, or the day before, 
um, cancer, you know, there was no, there was, there was no, there was, you got breast cancer, and breast cancer was a horrible disease, and people died from it. And uh, only in the last uh, 10 or, well, I'm not going to say how many years since I qualified, but quite a long time. Um, the, the, but in the last 10 or 15 years, there's been a, a huge development around cancer biology, uh, partly by the identification of these uh, cancer genes. And if you take out, for example, BRAC1 or BRAC2, these, these uh, known breast cancer genes, you take out a subgroup of patients, and then out of that you can draw um, a whole lot of other information about the groups of people who don't have that mutation, that opens up a whole other avenue of potential therapeutics. So what's going to happen now, um, I think, um, I'm predicting, is that the, the new gene, the, C, um, the C9 open reading frame 72, um, uh, that's going to uh, select out a group of patients, um, uh, about, about 8% in, in, in the RSC, it's probably 4% in yours, yeah. Um, and then we will have other subgroups of people with motor neuron disease who will, will have slightly other other different signatures and within each of those groups we'll find sets of treatments that are that will be tailor-made around the biology of what's going on. So finding genes is important, impor it's not the only lever but it's a very important lever to have to try and crack what looks like the same disease and everybody in, in our clinics it's very hard to tell the difference but, but the genes give us a, a, a lever and as Bob said the lever has already opened one set of treatments for one uh, subgroup of people with the SOD1 um, gene mutation but that's going to happen more and more the more uh, of these genes we understand, the more we can subclassify, the more we can get nuanced treatments. And I think this is a really, really exciting. What happened this year with the discovery of ubiquitin early this summer and the, the chromosome 9 gene uh, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, it's going to really change the face is going to happen. It's going to be a very interesting conference now this year, to, just, just because the beginning of, of the whole change, of a big change of, of how we look at things is going to happen at this conference uh, here, here, here in, um, in um, Sydney. Yes, in the back with the mic. Uh, my name is Brian Weber. I just wanted to ask a question of the panel. Um, a friend sent me something off the internet where there was some recent research published about a, uh, in, the, in the UK on a, a fish that they found um, um, where it could regenerate its motor neurons. I just wondered, I'm sorry I've forgotten the name of the fish. Um, but I just wondered if you could comment or had heard of that. No, stunned mullets, I think it was. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know the particular research you're talking about, but I mean the point you're making is a very... Okay, so, so zebra fish is a commonly used model, uh, and it's because it's been genetically well sort of understood and because it's transparent. Within 24 hours it grows all its organs. You can study it very quickly. Uh, regenerating nerve cells is something that, you know, only certain species are able to do. And I think one of the problems is that humans can't. And there is a very good reason for that, which is that you simply map out your in a connection between your nerve and your muscle when you're growing as a baby, as an embryo. And that has established. And the idea that you can rewire that later in life would be very chaotic in a normal physiological situation. So our ability to be flexible and to regenerate is genetically sort of switched off. And there are very strong genetic signals that prevent nerve cells from growing out. If you, you, know, if you put stem cells in the spinal cord, it, the, one of the barriers to actually regenerating your nerves is that that whole system, which allows it to grow down a limb, has been switched off in, in adult life. And overcoming some of those other signals is going to be an important way of ultimately developing rewiring therapies, regenerative therapies. Yeah, and, I mean, and, and to this extent, it's important to say that there's different ways that motor neurons regenerate. And we know already a little bit about these from, for instance, polio, um, where um, presumably once a motor neuron dies, there aren't strong regenerative capacities within m mammals. And I don't even think zebrafish to make new ones that would go all the way to their... Um, their muscular targets, but it's quite a routine thing for the so-called axon or the very long finger of the motor neuron which connects to the muscle cell to be damaged and to unplug uh, from the muscle cell. And there are very active communications we know between the muscle and uh, the, the motor neuron at that level to make the motor neuron plug back in. And, um, and certainly that unplugging is one of the early things that happens in ALS, we know. Um, and so promoting that sort of regeneration, this replugging in, is, is something that certain groups are pursuing as a potential ALS therapy. So I do think that depending on what, what, what the study showed, and without it in front of us, it's difficult to, to comment directly, um, 
but that sort of uh, research on making the motor neurons plug back in so that they don't die as a result of being unplugged is particularly interesting. Okay. Yep. Oh. One other thing, and that is that, you know, a lot of the focus for this disease has been looking at the body, the cell body of the motor neuron, because we can see it readily when we look at a spinal cord. But I just want to mention that there's a whole biology that goes with this finger-like projection, this axon. And it's now well understood that there are a set of molecular events that keep that axon alive or which affect the rate at which it dies, which are different from events that occur in the cell body. And I, I, I think... What I'm really trying to say is that there is a lot of, I think, grounds for optimism and understanding uh, the, the way in which one can help sustain the viability of that axon so that it can, as Kevin says, effectively extend itself to re-innervate uh, muscle. I, I think we're, we're, we're really at the uh, start of a brave new world in terms of axonal biology in some very compelling ways, which will clearly affect, I think, diseases like ALS. Well, I, think, I think as well that I just... Um, Going back to the theme of biomarkers, um, we know, of course, that motor neuron disease isn't just um, the, uh, the motor neuron going from the spine out into the muscle, but also the nerves coming from the brain down into the spine, and also some nerves connecting within different parts, as Kevin mentioned, the, the network. But actually, um, in, in, in Kevin's uh, um, group in Oxford and another number of other groups as well around Europe, um, there's a, a very active um, research going around looking at uh, going on looking at the um, the imaging of the brain and looking at the imaging of these connections in the white matter um, between different parts of the brain and and um, uh, Kevin's group just published a very nice paper actually quite recently looking at the connections within the the the, uh, the white matter changes that can happen um, in motor neuron disease and that that can be very useful as as a, as a developing biomarker as well to look at say the effects of drugs on axonal integrity it's a really exciting area as well. Thank you. Uh, we might turn to the internet for the next question. Philip, Alicia and Brian have all submitted questions about exercise. Some doctors are telling people with MND to exercise. Other doctors say don't exercise. Can exercise help people with MND delay or avoid respiratory failure? And what type of exercise do the experts consider to be suitable for people with MND? Kevin Talbot. Well, uh, I think personally, and I mean, you know, we, we need to understand this in much more detail, but I do not tell people to stop exercising. I think there's no compelling evidence that exercise, once the disease is established, drives progression. And personally, I don't believe that doing the exercise ultimately even triggers the disease, but that's an open question. Exercise is beneficial for the same reasons it's beneficial for anybody. It improves your general well-being. When your activity levels go down, people start to, their sleep is disrupted. Um, you know, spasms and cramps, which are things that are upper motor neuron features of motor neuron disease, are commoner if you are inactive. So I think there are many reasons why exercise is the right thing to do. Now, I think one simply has to sort of take a practical approach. I wouldn't, I never recommend that somebody start doing exercise they didn't previously do. So suddenly taking to the gym when you weren't somebody who did that is, is, is unlikely to be be helpful, but adaptability and, and improvisation is important. So swimming, for example, is a very good form of exercise because it removes the mechanical disadvantage, the gravity disadvantage. You can move your limbs through a greater range. So swimming is extremely good, supervised so that people don't slip over in the pool, etc. Uh, cycling on a, an immobilized bicycle. I mean, there are many things you can do. And I think, it's, again, it's a very individual thing. It's very difficult to give a general kind of... Uh, piece of advice. And in fact, the advice is very practical. It's not biological. I don't think we know that certain kinds of exercise protect motor neurons or protect respiratory muscles. At the moment, we don't know enough about the relationship between activity and, and muscle degeneration. Orla, did you have anything to add? No, I mean, I think there is, there is some mouse work suggesting that actually exercise in the SOD1 mouse model actually improves uh, outcome. But, uh, but I completely agree. Uh, there is some work going on here in, um, in Australia. Uh, Matthew Kiernan's group has been looking at um, the use of um, um, breathing exercises. And really, there isn't a huge amount of difference between people who undertake these breathing exercises and people who don't with regard to outcome. But I completely agree with Kevin that um, um, from a, a, a general fitness 
um, point of view, that, that exercise is good. With one caveat, that, that we need to keep an eye on the nutrition as well. We know that nutrition is very important in motor neurons disease and, and maintaining a high level of nutrition and, and probably actually a very unhealthy diet, as we would generally consider with high fat, high protein, um, it's probably it's probably quite important as well. Uh, so so my, my caveat would be that uh, uh, to maintain the caloric intake and match the caloric intake with the exercise, and not to uh, uh, not to start losing weight because we know that losing weight is 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 not a good idea. And and um, uh, the Dutch group, uh, Leonard Vandenberg's group, and I think Kevin's group as well have shown that um, uh, having a sort of a high risk cardiovascular profile is actually. Uh, is, is actually somewhat protective, so so we would normally recommend that people maintain a high caloric intake, high pat, high fat, high protein diet. There's there's a question right up the back there. You guys need a mic. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raghav Ram, and uh, I come from India. My dad's been diagnosed with MND. My question for you is, and most neurologists get stick, get ticked off about this, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> is that uh, the, one of the first searches when you try and search for a cure for MND is the traditional Chinese medicine. So I know <clears throat> most of the neurologists that I spoke with in India, in the US, and in Australia tend to give me really subjective, vague answers as in, you know, it's your own thing, I'm not sure, I don't know kind of a thing. But What's your question? The question is, uh, do you know of any patients in your vast experience who have tried the traditional Chinese option and have seen any benefits? And, uh, or if you would even be a proponent of that, Paula, do you want to? Well, I mean, I, I think I think um, we, we need to um, uh, probably uh, there is an element of, of of sort of Western imperialism thinking that because we we are from the West that um, we we have a greater knowledge base, we have a different knowledge base, but uh, but I think that. Um, we still, science knows no boundaries, and I still, still think we need to apply the same scientific rigor over what's perceived as a traditional uh, treatment modality and uh, what, we, what would be considered a modern treatment modality. It's still, we still have to apply the same stringent uh, standards, which is, um, have, have you been able to show that it's not a placebo effect? Have you been able to show that it's not sub subjective uh, bias on the patient of the patient? Or on the patient of the on 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 the side of the um, of the observer. So I think that um, that uh, I think that we would need to hold the traditional Chinese approaches to the same level of stringent scientific rigor as we do for drugs that are developed by conventional Western pharma. There, there are groups, like I said, this company Phytopharm, which is a UK-based company, that's actually looking at uh, potentially beneficial compounds within the Chinese. Um, medical pharmacopoeia and trying to develop, uh, trying to extract out what the active agents are. So there is, there are processes going on trying to marry the two technologies together. But but I th still think that we need to hold the traditional medicines to the same scientific rigor as we hold our, our conventional Western medicines. And to answer your question, we ha I have had uh, patients who've gone to China and who've gone to other places and have engaged in these um, uh, um, uh, with these, these treatments and, and, and the outcome was the same in, in, in that subjective experience but I, I think that we should do trials to see if, that re if, these, if these drugs really work. Thanks Ola. Kevin do you have a comment? Well I think very similar to all already but I think the, you know, the notion that there are alternative treatments you know which have some kind of um, hidden or mystical quality that are being ignored by Western scientists is wrong, really. I think we are very open-minded. I'm simply interested in things that work and things that don't work. That's all I'm interested in, exactly the same as everybody else in this room, and my mind is completely wide open. But I cannot be persuaded, as a scientist and as an honest doctor looking at my patients in the eye, I cannot be persuaded by individual anecdote because that simply is not good enough. It is not going to be reliable. And I think patients with motor neuron disease are very vulnerable, and there are lots of people out there who can persuade them with the internet or otherwise that they have the answer to their problem. And then they sit in front of a neurologist who says, well, actually, this is not a curable disease. So I can understand completely why somebody might go for the first option. But I, the minute I stop being honest with people and stop being a scientist as well as a doctor, and I think ultimately I'm going to um, fail my patients. And I think as long as we're on this topic of vulnerability, I think that one thing I didn't say very um, strongly enough in my talk was 
um, to comment on uh, stem cell treatments for ALS. And, and again, um, you know, when one thinks about stem cell research, one hears terms like medical tourism and things like this with the notion, well, there's no treatment for me here, so where can I go for a treatment? Um, I know, um, although there are some new clinical trials that are starting, which I think are, are, are legitimate trials based in, in reasonable biology that are happening in, in, in the United States and can be found on, um, on the, the website that was mentioned earlier. Um, if you are uh, interested in a stem cell therapy or a stem cell trial, um, my advice to you is to visit the International Society for Stem Cell Research website. They have they're extremely well-developed tools for patients. Um, they've um, done a very good job of looking into so-called stem cell clinics around the world um, and have taken a, what I would call a, a very harsh eye at those who would take advantage of uh, 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 people who are uh, sick and uh, being offered expensive uh, so-called stem cell therapies, which, which have uh, very little promise and probably a great deal of danger associated with them. So. Uh, before you embark on a, a trip of any sort, I would strongly recommend that you, um, that, that you visit that, that website. So the International Society for Stem Cell Research um, is a good place to begin, and I think I would probably cross-reference that with these ALS clinical trial um, sites. And if, if you can't find um, the right intersection of those things, um, then, then don't do it. There's, there's another resource as well, which is... Uh Called a, group, a group called ALS Untangled, and it's a group of, um, of um, ALS uh, uh, clinicians uh, re led by uh, Rick Bedlack uh, from the US. Um, and uh, it's, it's a website, if you Google ALS Untangled, you'll find it. And, and, and Rick and, and a group of us um, will accept uh, uh, suggestions to investigate alternative or, or unregulated therapies and we'll, we'll do a sort of an investigative piece around that and then publish the outcome in the ALS journal. And that's that, that, that ALS Untangled uh, um, piece in the ALS Journal is actually available as a free download if you go into the um, ALS Journal. And uh, we've, done, uh, we've investigated a couple of stem cell sites and uh, quite a number of other, I think we're on number 12 or 13 of, of the ALS uh, Untangled investigation. But if you have a, a potential therapy or a p potential treatment or something that you'd like us to investigate, uh, you, can, you can put in a request on the ALS Untangled site and, and Rick will, will, will set about uh, an investigation around that, and we will publish the results in the LS Journal. You'd never guess I was the editor of the journal, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me that the zebrafish was also Irish. <laughs> Probably is. Uh, Lisa, down, down the front. Hi. Um, I hope you speak MND. Uh, I um, have a question. Having MND... And breast cancer last year, and previously Hodgkin's. I'm going for genetic testing um, in January for the breast cancer. What do they only look for that, or will they look at my whole profile? So, uh, the common practice now is to look specifically at targeted genes or even for just specific mutations in targeted genes. Um, there's virtually no place yet uh, that will, on a standard clinical diagnostic basis, do the whole genome. Um, there are places that will do that experimentally. Um, it is possible, if one is interested, for example, in screening breast cancer genes on the one hand and ALS on the other, to request that those all be done, and indeed they can be done to the extent that we know them. Uh, but there, uh, it, it is not yet common practice to do the whole genome as a response to the kind of screening you've just mentioned. Yeah. The, 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 closest, op the closest option which is currently available is a, is a private option, um, which, is, which is to basically um, uh, enroll in a, in a company-run program, um, these so-called personal genomics companies in which you spit on a tube and they look at your genetic variants. Um, the, the two companies that I think are the furthest ahead in this are 23andMe and Navigenics. Um, now, I think it's important to say um, that um, 
they will look at things uh, like, for instance, your risk of uh, Huntington's disease by looking at the Huntington gene. Um, there are a small number of genes which have variants which have a large effect, as many of you know is the case for ALS. Um, and then there are uh, many different variants which uh, can have a very small effect on important things, like a very small effect on your risk for Alzheimer's disease. And some of those are quite common things. And so one of the, the sort of side effects of having a more general look at your genome is that um, you have to be prepared to deal with the information when you get it, as you, as you very well know. And, uh, and so I think that that's something that people often don't take um, seriously enough before they, they participate in, in, in an activity like that. I mean, Bob, what's your general feeling? Yeah, my only, uh, so two comments. One is that in a situation like this, we strongly recommend that it's worth uh, an hour's uh, uh, consultation with the genetics counselor to really go over what the full uh, set of options means. As you know, it is just as hard to interpret a negative as a positive, as a matter of fact. Uh, the only other comment I would make is that these uh, personal genomics uh, companies tend to have panels of things they look for, which is to say that they may not look in depth at specific entities. I mean, they, they, for example, 23andMe tends to do a panel of, remarkably enough, a million different markers, but that's not to say, at least uh, in the standard format, that they look at every possible breast cancer gene. So again, one would... Uh, it seems to me require counseling to know just what they look for and, and how that matches what could be looked for. You know. We might just turn to the internet for the next question. Rachel and Peter have both asked questions about participating in research. And from Rachel, we have two diagnosed members of our family with MND. The entire family is willing to cooperate in research and testing. How can we get involved as our GPs and specialists don't appear to be interested at all? Is there no call for familial cases? And then the second part of that from Peter, would it assist if people in Australia could donate samples to the overseas researchers? If so, how could that be done? Well, I'd, I'd better speak on the local side. So there are um, uh, certainly in Australia, there are, there's a very large MND DNA bank that's run by Roger Pamphlet. Uh, out of Sydney University and it's very easy to find. So that's in sporadic motor neuron disease. And Garth Nicholson working out of Concord at the ANZICS uh, works on genetic forms of motor neuron disease. So they're the two Sydney sides and they collaborate uh, with Nigel Lang in Perth and the team up, teams up in Brisbane and the teams in Melbourne. So there are in each, um, it, it's quite surprising that, that if they're local questions that that, that has been the response. And similarly, I would imagine there'd be a very large DNA um, uh, bank in, in any major city uh, um, in Europe or North America, um, South America, Australia. Can I, can I make a comment just about, uh, about the, um, the value of, part of being not just participation in research, <coughs> but of of uh, attending a multidisciplinary clinic, and I know there are very well-run multidisciplinary clinics around, around Australia, and Dominic is, in, is involved in one. And, and there's really, really good evidence now um, from a number of different centres, from our group in Ireland and, and, and um, Italy and, and um, um, Holland and also in the US, that, that people who, who attend uh, multidisciplinary clinics where, where there are people who know about motor neuron disease, it's a rare disease, um, that, that the outcome is better, and this is independent of all the things that um, that multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary clinics tend to bring people who are younger, who are healthier so in, in some countries where, where they're better off financially. Um, but but if, you, if you do a statistical analysis, even with all of those variables and taking out all those variables that we know can bias the results, there's still evidence that attending a multidisciplinary clinic is better for people. It's better both for outcome, people survive longer. In our data, people survive about nine months longer in Ireland, a small country. Um, but, but also there's, there's data um, from other groups showing that the quality of life, people have a better quality of life as well, and, and that their rates of hospitalisation are actually reduced. So, so research isn't just about genetics, research is about the clinical um, progression as well, and I would strongly urge people to, uh, if, if they're having difficulty, um, and I don't know how the Australian system works, but, but it's really important to, to try and make sure that you do get yourself linked in with a multidisciplinary clinic, they're, 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 people just do much better when they tell, attend multidisciplinary clinics. You probably want to give your address, uh, Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh -huh, yes, there's a question down here at the front in the, in the black. Yep. Can we have a mic over here, please? Yep, just here. Uh, and, uh, you know, Australia has, does have a few geographical um, barriers too. We ac actually, we do, uh, at, at Macquarie, where I am, we do a lot of Skype work too. So we manage people um, who, who find travel difficult to major centres. So in this day and age, uh, there is no barrier to, to multidisciplinary care. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Cathy Bell and I have a quick question. The SOD1 gene runs in my family. Um, I've lost my grandma, my dad, my uncle and my auntie to it. And my question is, are there any beliefs amongst the panel of any diet or treatments that may delay the onset of the disease in people who have been diagnosed young? Um, I know amongst our family we've had varying ages, you know, from 42 to 70 of onset and just wanted... Yeah, that's my question. Bob, Bob do you want to take that? So. so um what I can say is that there, there are no clear factors identified that can be uh, invoked uh, basically to either hasten or delay the onset at this stage. Uh, an awful lot of folks we know who have been in this kind of situation, for example, have tried uh, uh, regimens of intensive uh, antioxidant therapy. Um, there, there are a variety of sort of anecdotes of that sort, but there's really nothing that's proven. However, what, what, I, uh, what I think is, is crucial is that uh, this new therapy for turning off or silencing the offending gene is very close at hand. And if indeed it looks promising in individuals already with the illness, you can be very sure that there will be an effort made to consider how it might be used prospectively. Uh, basically, uh, before the onset of the illness. So, uh, you know, I would I would say uh, there is a lot uh, just around the corner, but unfortunately, there's, I'm not aware of any specific intervention that will address the important question and need you've just articulated. I don't know if Kevin or uh, Orla would like to comment. Well, I know that Merritt was mentioning some study that had just come out on pregnancy, interestingly enough, but I haven't looked closely enough at the data, and so, Bob, I don't know if you've looked at that study in detail. Well, I mean, just as an aside, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest risk factors uh, for ALS is gender. And, and so there is something about being, for example, female and having presumably high or higher levels of estrogen uh, throughout one's early adult life that confers some resistance to ALS. And the pregnancy story may indeed be an offshoot or an extension of that. Um, but uh, I, I don't know of a way to construe that to make it helpful for the, re, as a response to your question, which is a very good and a very important question. Yeah. Uh, and I will also say that there are efforts underway to develop not just these, uh, in, if you will, invasive methods to silence a gene that involve putting a catheter into the spinal fluid, but there are attempts to discover small molecules that can be given by mouth that may achieve the same goal. Uh, so, so there is a lot of effort focusing on, on, on an answer to your question, although we don't have a firm, concrete response at this time. Um, yes, there's Graham. There's this, a question over here. Just wait for the mic if you could, Graham. Graham Lang, MND Victoria. Uh, just to go back to the question of donating tissue, uh, Victoria now has a, a tissue bank which has collected... 51 brains and 51 spinal cords from uh, people who've died of MND and uh, some other material as well, but uh, it's, it's quite easy to donate tissue to that. Uh, if, if anybody wants to do that, uh, let somebody in the MND association know and we'll organise it. Perhaps I could just uh, make the comment, Dominic, that you know, people may think that uh, we've had plenty of opportunity to look at the brain and spinal cord and we've learned what we need to learn. I would say that in the last five years, some of the major advances in our understanding of motor neuron disease are coming from looking at brain tissue, correlating that with genetic defects and with uh, clinical features. And therefore, you know, neuropathology is undergoing a renaissance, and it's playing a major role in increasing our understanding. So although it's a very sensitive subject and some people will find it difficult to contemplate, I think m many of my patients spontaneously ask me whether it would be useful and I think the answer is very much yes. So we have time for two more questions. One from the internet, Kate, please. Um, this one is directed to Dr Hardiman from Rob and Benno. And it's simply, can you give us a very quick update on um, dexapramipexol? Excuse my pronunciation. Okay, dexapramipexol is, um, is a, a compound 
uh, that was developed uh, initially in the University of Pittsburgh and uh, uh, taken over by Knopp um, uh, Pharmaceuticals and then subsequently partnering with um, a company called Biogen, which is based in, uh, in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, the, there was a phase two trial of dexpamipexil, which was performed um, about two years ago now, uh, which showed a very um, uh, a, 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 a signal um, wh which looked um, uh, very hopeful, showing that there was a, 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 an effect on survival in a small group of people who'd taken dexpamipexil and that it seemed to be dose dependent and that the higher dose, the dose you went, the better the effect. And based on that, a, a phase three uh, study was initiated. Um, it began um, in the US uh, in about February of, of this year and, and it rolled out to uh, um, other countries in Europe um, uh, later on. Uh, it closed, in, recruitment was very well subscribed and closed in, to recruitment in um, the beginning of September. Uh, that study is called Empower. There's a second study that's just about to get going uh, called Enable, and I think that's coming to Australia as well, Dominic. Yeah, uh, and I, that the design of that study is just is just being finished now. Bob may have some more information on that, but it's uh, my understanding is that the the plan is to uh, open up recruitment uh, just at the end of the first quarter of 2012. Dominic, you may have more information on that okay. as well. We don't know, of course, about the outcome of the first phase three, the Empower study, because it's. Uh, what's called a double-blind placebo-controlled study. In other words, the patient doesn't know they're on the drug and the investigator doesn't know they're on the drug. Um, it's, it's a randomized study where we, we um, see the patient and we ring up uh, the, the center, the coordinating center, and we're given a, a number uh, to take down off the shelf of, the, uh, of a drug pack and we give it to the patient. So we don't know whether the patient is on the drug or not. Uh, we'll know at the end of 18 months um, whether the drug has been effective or not. And I think the second study, the NABLE study, will be another eight or ten months behind that. Um, the, we're very hopeful, though, that the drug, um, based on the phase two study, that the drug is going to be effective. If it is, it's going to be um, a big um, opening, a big, a big, a new development, because there's a, the mechanism of action isn't that well worked out, actually. It's one of these serendipitous drugs where the, um, the, the neuroprotective part of the drug was, was found almost by accident. Um, but if, it's, if, if this drug works, it opens up a whole new avenue of potential drug development, modifying the structure of the drug, looking at where it's working, maybe improving that, tweaking a little bit here and there. Uh, so it's a very exciting time. We'll know in about um, 18 months, I think, uh, the outcome of, of the, the first of, 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 of um, the Empower study. Do you have anything to add, Bob? That? No, no, that's absolutely right. The extraordinary thing is that 950 people were enrolled in this study in less than a year. I mean, it was just a record-breaking uh, effort on the part of the company and many clinics. And uh, all in all, it uh, ha has a lot of very exciting momentum. Does it bother you that they don't know how it works? So uh, yes no. and no. I mean, so they will, uh, they will tell you that what it does is boost Kevin's batteries. In other words, it takes the mitochondria and, 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 and leads to 10 or 15 percent greater output of ATP. I'll also tell you that if you draw the structure of this compound and you draw, draw the structure of riazole, they're very much alike. In other words, they're almost superimposable. And I don't think anyone's ever tested dexpramipexol as an anti-excitotoxic. So that's another possibility. But uh, I, I'm not bothered because the first study, which was uh, basically an investigator study, showed a possible benefit. A second study, just published two weeks ago, showed, as Orla said, another indication of benefit. And that alone is really uh, to a better footing than we've had for most other trials we've embarked on. The vast majority of anti-epileptic anti drugs, Kevin, or um, Dominic, we don't know how they work. Zora. So the last question from Zora, down the front. Thank you. My name is Aurora's Milk Fisher. I have been taking Relutec for three years, so what if any benefit have I got from Relutec if it does not protect my neurons? Kevin, yep. Yeah. Um, well, I think that, are you referring to one of the slides that was shown? I don't think that's what it said. Um, so I think that... Uh, Kevin is referring to the specific effect of glia, which are these support cells. You raise another general point, which is that when you do a clinical trial, and say Rilizol was tested in 800 people, 400 took Rilizol, 400 took a placebo, that tells you that there's a biological effect. It doesn't tell you 
what it does to an individual. We've already told you many times over today that ALS and MND is a complex disease, everyone's different. So I think taking a drug like Riluzole is an act of faith, if you like, based upon evidence, but what it's doing to you as an individual, I don't think you can ever really know, unfortunately. But that's true of many medicines. Okay, and, and, I, and I think it's very important to say that, because it's in part, I would say, inspired by the data that I showed, is that it seems that there are many different components to motor neuron disease. It's a very complicated story. And I think all of our view is that it would be desirable to intervene in as many different ways as possible. So um, as a scientist, one thing that you'd like to do is, to, again, I mean, there's a danger, as we discussed, to take this reductionalist approach where you say, all right, um, maybe the drugs that we have aren't affecting this particular pathway. That means that that's a therapeutic opportunity, not that the drug is doing nothing. And for instance, um, uh, what one would predict is that the second piece of data that I showed where you saw that the motor neurons uh, from the ALS or made from the ALS patient stem cells were firing uh, more actively than their components, one might predict that realizol would be partially protective in that case, and we're testing to see if that's, if that's true right, right now. And so these model systems, it's, a, it's, it's an iterative approach in a way because the systems allow us to discover drugs, but they then also allow us to go back and test how we think the drugs are working. And that, that's really what I was trying to exemplify with, with, with that slide. Not that realizol isn't neuroprotective, it's just that it's not uh, necessarily protecting through that means or that mechanism. Bob? So I, I might add one other point just by way of reassurance, and, and that is that in addition to the studies that Kevin has mentioned that were first done suggesting a benefit in the 400 treated people, there have been retrospective studies looking at large series of folks treated, showing again and again that Riazol does appear in these studies to have benefit. It's not enormous, but it seems to be quite reproducible. And, and so I would uh, suggest that that's somewhat reassuring. I would point out that when the first leukemia, childhood leukemia drug, was tested by Sidney Farber in the early 50s, an antifolate drug, its effect on leukemia was more or less about like what Riazol does in ALS. And the point is, we now know that that form of leukemia is completely curable, that that first step, which was an important step, was modest, but indeed it was a first step. And I, I firmly believe that that's going to be the case in motor neuron disease. We've run out of time. It's often said that if you want to learn how to swim, you shouldn't head to calm water, you've got to head to rough water. And these four experts have headed into rough water some a short time ago, some a little bit longer, and some a little bit longer still, but it's because of their efforts that we can sit here and learn from them. Minds are like parachutes. They only work if they're open. So I'd like to ask you to thank Kevin, Kevin, Orla, and Bob for just a fantastic session. I've had a, I've had a ball. Fingers here, we'll be able to bring it to the duty free. <laughs>